Hey, what's going on, Red? Hey, dude, how you doing? I'm great, man. What's going on in the UK? Yeah, not much other than cold weather. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. What what part of uh, whereabouts are you based? I'm in Florida right now. Oh, okay. So you're probably. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm feeling that Grenada vibe a little bit, though know, it's probably even warmer down there. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Appreciate it. It's good to connect. Yeah, no worries. No, happy to be on. L- loving the Instagram too. You uh, have some really good ideas out there. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to trying to pump up the uh, the content game a bit this year. So, uh, man, yeah. you're you're ahead above a lot of people in that. I think so. It's yeah, keep it going. It's good. No, cheers. No, it's, it's funny actually. I I started doing it like quite a lot last year, right? Um, and the growth was like crazy. I went from like 10k followers to 15k in a couple months, and then it got to race season. I was like, okay, it's a bit stressful, so I'll probably stop in the race season, then just get back to it next like winter. And I'll keep growing and I'm back to it. And it's just like not the same at all. Like, it's I don't know, just the algorithm's changed or what, but I just can't do what I used to do. You know, yeah, I guess when it's hot, you got to keep it rolling. But I think yeah. why, yeah. What, what what would make you where you just feel like you were too busy or you didn't have enough stuff to post? Because I actually looked on your YouTube and you were like, hey, I'm back. And I, and I always am curious, like, why not keep going? You have so many things that so many people would want to know about. Um, well, I'm planning to, I think for that kind of thing, I put too much pressure on myself to make like a an interesting video and an entertaining video. Um, and I had like this creative pressure. It was like the creative energy where I just couldn't, like I had the time, I had kind of a bit of general energy, but like that creative energy where, you know, you're straight racing, mm. stress the training and all that. I just felt like I couldn't do it. And I was like, okay, if that's, if there's a first thing to go, the media is going because the racing is a priority. Totally. Um, but I think this year I want to do more of like a, as you could call it, like a raw edit kind of thing, where I just, you know, speak to the camera, do a couple cuts, and then chuck it up. And it's low effort, but still giving like the same kind of informational content or mm-hmm. perspective kind of thing that people might want to see. I think even like B-roll, behind the scenes stuff of what you're doing, you know, Commonwealth Games. suit. Like I watched a couple of videos that, uh, I don't know who actually put them together um, now that I I don't know whose Facebook page that was. It might've been the Commonwealth games, but it was just super cool. Like you and your dad and a little bit of history. And then I read like an article about this. It's like, Oh, well there'd be cool to hear about this from him as opposed to all these, you know, so like really get it from the source. So I don't know, just some thoughts, but yeah, keep it rolling. It's awesome. And you can take your personality shines through with it. Like it's very authentic and just like, Oh, I like this guy. He's got a good, good thing going on. So uh, cheers. I appreciate that. Yeah, that might be. So I've actually been to Grenada. No way. Yeah, my buddy went to St. George's for medical school. And oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. We had just got this is 2004. I think I flew out there. It was either right after Hurricane Ivan or Emily. Maybe that was the year yeah. after. Um, I think I remember Ivan. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it was actually the trip almost got canceled because his school schedule totally flipped because he had off. They closed everything down. I was flying in the next week and he's like, man, I got, I have class these three days. I think I was only there four or five days. I was like, well, I'll like go kick it at a resort or something like whatever. I'll, it's grenade. I'm gonna have a blast anyways and chill on the yeah. beach. We've been up after class, but yeah, it was really cool. I wish I could have stayed longer, but neat little spot on the globe for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I yeah. definitely. And so your dad's from, is it your dad's from London and your mom's from Grenada? Yeah, my mom's from Grenada. My dad, well, not London, but British. Um, he lived in London at some point, I think. But, you know, yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's do a quick intro. I don't like to put the words in your mouth. So introduce yourself to people. Who is Red Walters? Uh, hey, guys, I'm uh, Red Walters. I'm a road cyclist, bit of track as well. Um, I represent Grenada. Um and I guess to sum it up, my dream is to be a pro cyclist. I think that's that's a concise way of putting it. But yeah, that's that's my goal. That's everything everything I'm doing right now. So I love that you are very verbal about saying, hey, I want to be in the world tour. Hey, I want to win medals. Hey, I want to do these things. Because I've asked a lot of people on this podcast, what's your biggest goal? I think one person has maybe said world champion. And I get it. We know we all have like our levels 
But especially for someone at your age where you don't really know how far you can go with this thing to say, Hey, I want to be in the world tour. A lot of people don't say that. I like, do you just, are you just a confident person? Are you just like, let me put this out into the universe or, you know, other people are like, oh, I kind of like you're on a Conti team now. Some people are like, dude, you've got years till you get there. Like, what's your thought process in that? Yeah. I didn't, there's always like, there's always that reaction of like, no way, bro. Like <laughs> no way. Um, and I think there, there's, there just has to be like, obviously one element is confidence. Like you have to back yourself and that's just the case probably for any sport or most sports. Um, and then there's just like a little bit of like willful delusion where, you know, it's like, okay, let's be realistic. The chances, the amount of people who try compared to how many people do it, it's like a tiny percentage, right? So like, if we're talking numbers, it's a low chance, but like, why not back yourself? Like no one gets there. Well, maybe some do, but most people, I'm sure most people who get there don't get there by thinking they can't do it, right? So, um, yeah, you got to back yourself. And there's the whole, uh, uh, what's the, I can never, I always lose this word when you uh, will it into existence. Um, oh, there's a word for it. And I always, I, it always escapes me. But, you know, you just got to, yeah, you, you just believe it in it. It happens, the positivity kind of, you know. It's killing me because I'm like, what is that? Manifest. Word now? Manifest, manifest. That's the one. Nice. You manifest Solid. it. Solid. So, and then you said you kind of track. So did you start on the track or was track afterwards? Because it looked like, and when you went to the, con so let's go there first. Do you yeah. Track first or after road? Uh, no. So yeah, road first. I started road. I was doing road fairly casually for about a year. I think you know, I had race at that point. And then this is especially a funny story how I got into track. So my friend posted in my local club's Facebook group, Hey, uh, London 6, 8, under 21, there's just this application page. Who wants to do it? And I was like, oh, I've never done track before, but that looks really cool. So we applied, somehow got in, having never ridden track. Well, he'd ridden a bit, but neither of us had race track, let alone any kind of um, accreditation or things like that. So we did, I think, like two training sessions. I was borrowing his spare track bike. And then we rock up and we're like, the other riders are like, yo, what the hell, like, these guys haven't ridden track before <laughs> so they're getting this crash course like yeah don't undertake do not undertake a, a hand sling change and you'll be fine we lost like 20 something laps over the three days um but we had a blast we didn't crash um so it was, yeah it was you didn't crash that's pretty amazing fun. i feel yeah. like crashing would come <laughs> with the territory when you're yeah new. so you had made a comment in the commonwealth games video where you're like, oh man, I haven't ridden the track bike in a couple of years. And I was dying. I'm like, dude, this guy is out there in the Commonwealth Games. He's clearly like not brushed up a lot before this thing is just going for it. What's, were you, did that make you nervous at all? Like, did it add more butterflies? Or were you just like, you know what? I'm just going to go race a bike. Yeah. So, like, the frustrating thing is, like, I think I'm naturally, track comes to me more naturally than road. Like, I think I'm more built for it than, the average road race so in the early days at that sort of regional level i'd always do better at track than i did at road mm. um but it's just one of the things you can't really you look at like the career progression in track compared to road you can't like you can do olympics sort of target but that's it and there's not really much in between that i mean there's a few things you can do you can do like world cups with them that's it's all based around um national federation and there's not that much racing so i was like okay focus put all the eggs on the road because you don't just want to be average at both right um and i do i do want to come back to track but yeah like you said that that race i was just kind of like hey let's just go into it let's have fun maybe i'll have a good ride i think i was maybe a bit naive thinking i could just sort of hold my own after not touching the track bike <laughs> for, for a year <laughs> well, but made again it, you made it to the finals i mean I, ma I made it to the finals i managed to not crash after like the most horrific pile up i don't know if you saw that this no, the one... they didn't. They, they, they okay, so they cut that out. So, did you crash oh, okay. in that last race? I so I didn't crash. This is the qualifier for the first one, I think. Okay. This is a really like there is just strung out last lap. Um, and I remember I was like, it's top 10 qualifier, and I was like, okay, I'm 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 like eighth place, this is pretty good. And then a couple of people overtook me. I was like, ah, oh, I'm probably around 10th right now, I, I can't get overtaken anymore. And then you hear that sound, you look up, and you just see riders everywhere. And I was like this close to like hitting some guy who'd fallen um and like yeah some guys were out for ages concussion fractured Ooh. bones um but i ended up being second in the qualifier which is a bit of a a funny flex so, that's crazy yeah well yeah. and you you had uh you'd made a comment that you were backpedaling but doesn't track by you you're like oh, i have to 
I'm in the group and I have to like backpedal real quick. What do you oh, mean? What do you mean by that? Because so, in a track bike, you, it's fi it's fixed, isn't it? Or no? Yeah, no, it is. So when I I say that, I refer to like putting pressure backwards Got it. Okay. on the pedals. So okay. obviously, when when you're more experienced, and I I feel like I got to that point when I was racing more regularly, you sort of you don't really have to do that. You can you put just the right pressure. You can you ease up to a wheel, mm -hmm. and you just you just time it perfectly all the time. But this time I was like, oh, crap, just like stomping back on the pedals every other, you know, all the time because I messed it up. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things, a skill you develop. That's wild. I've never raced on the track, but so I grew up near Canada in Rochester, New York. And the old school, this is in probably 2008 and nine. Uh, the winter rides, like the winter endurance group rides are 75% of the people are on fixed gears and oh, they right. would go out and do like a two or three hour ride. And we're a couple of us were doing like centuries on these fixies. We did have breaks though, since it was like still kind of snowing. And I was like, this is sort of sketch. Like I don't, I'm not comfortable enough to like be slamming on the brakes, like with no brakes. Um, mm. a couple guys did it and it was just like, yeah, it wasn't for me, but the, the track, there's a track actually down here outside. I think it's Brian Piccolo and people in the Southeast come down here and a couple people have been trying to get me out there, but I just like driving to ride and I'm like addicted to the road and I don't know, maybe at some point, but yeah, let's, um, so I'd love to talk some nitty gritty training stuff, maybe look forward at some racing, uh, goals and what you kind of have on the calendar for 2024 Maybe if we have time, gym and nutrition stuff. And then if there's anything else that you want to bring up, go on some tangents, wherever. I uh, just really would have a conversation about your training and racing. And um, hopefully we can inspire and take some of your knowledge and pass it on to some other people, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sounds great. I'm always happy to to share the knowledge. Awesome. So what is, I, I just am always curious about this. What's your favorite training session where something that you just see on the calendar and you're like, I, you just always enjoy it or, um, maybe even something that you see very often. Yeah. So it's, so I changed coach, uh, last winter. So right around this time last year. Um, and this isn't obviously I don't, don't criticize my old coach at all. Really yeah. love him, and it was great, great training. But this new coach, something's working for me. So it's obviously it's it's been going well, um, and it's fun. Like it, enjoy. I'm not sure is the word I would use, um, but the training session that I'd probably say. Well, okay, I'll give you two actually. The the training session that I look forward to purely because I know the gains are going to be good, mm -hmm. not because like I enjoy it. It's it's very, pretty simple, you know, threshold session. Um, what is it? Well, we do it varies obviously a lot like the normal one in season will be like five times 10 minutes. Um, and that's, that's it. I know that's a good session. Cause like, at, just, oh, is it at a power target? Is it RPE? Is it heart rate? What's the 10 minutes at? Uh, it's all power. I think so normally around, Oh, I don't want to expose like, yeah, three no, like per so you just percentage of FTP. You don't have to give us like numbers. Oh, I think it's, I'm not, you know what? I'm not even sure what it's listed. I literally got my training peaks open on my second monitor. Um, what does he call it? Uh, I like this because ah, there I we go. Back uh, one um, of our earlier podcast guests, James Walsh. He's a big gravel guy out west here in the states, and he loves four by tens. So these are probably yeah. going to be similar. He's just like, I just love the way if I crank out the the last one. He's doing one less than you, but uh, yeah, he's like, I swear by this. Yeah, yeah. So he's got to hit is around one hundred and five percent. So okay, nice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan yeah. of those. What, do you ever do any low cadence work? Uh, no, I, I have done in the past, but now I do a fair amount. Well, not right now, but I'm building back into doing a fair amount of gym. Okay. Ah, so, well, we'll get to the gym. What's So that might be your favorite training session because of the gains. I was going to actually ask you, what do you think is the most impactful training session? What's another one that you really like that when you complete it, not only do you feel like, oh man, good job, Red. That was like... <laughs> go in the dojo you do your work but you also feel like that does something for you yeah um oh there's two there's, there's a fat max session and then there's a vo2 session so kind of like polarized 
I'll, I'll, go, with, I'll go with the VO2 session because that one. Give us both. People are going to want yeah. I mean, we could talk about workouts all. That could be a whole podcast of just workouts. Yeah. And people love this stuff. So what's your fat max session? Um, Do you do inside or do you just use their terminology? Like, is it, do you do the test? Uh, No, no, we, okay. we don't do. I know inside, but we don't uh, do that. I'm just Although curious. It's... When people say fat max, they usually go down that route. But yeah, yeah. It's, so... it's more of like a, I guess it's more of a, um, I guess it's not specific fat max. It's like roughly fat max, but you know, that's the idea. So um, what would you guys consider that as like a high endurance tempo or easy? I think it, it's not quite tempo. So like high, high zone two, I think is what it pretty much is. Uh, like the top end of zone two. Um, How long are you doing it for? So again, we build it up and I think we got up to like three times 40 minutes last cool. year. Awesome. Um and then do that like on low carb. So I'll have like, you know, 30 gram of carbs for breakfast and then nothing until I finish the uh, efforts. Oof. How do you feel after it's that? It's one of those, you know what? It's one of those things. The first one is like grim. And the second one, it's like, it's nice because you get out of bed, you're like, right, let's go. Like it just, it just encourages you to just get out for the ride easier. Mm -hmm. And I find once you've done it a few times, it's not like, I don't know. It it just it doesn't impact me. Like I still like I make sure I'm recouping it, or recouping the right amount in the rest of the day and eating properly after. Um, so it's yeah, it, it's not too bad. I, I I do like it. That's the that's one I enjoy because you're just motoring around, especially like when I'm on. So I do it most in like training camp. So January if I'm in Calpe, and you're just motoring around and there's loads of riders anyway, and you're just overtaking everyone, just feeling like an absolute god. And it's just is that's why it's so fun. That's hilarious. What's the VO2 max session? Uh, that's like, again, varies, but eight to 10 times two minutes. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, two minutes on, two minutes off. Sometimes three minutes off if I if he's feeling a bit kind to give me some more recovery. <laughs> um, and it's one of those things, it's like that small that small change is like enough to make it feel a lot easier, even if it, I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but it's just, you see the plan, oh, it's VO2. Oh, yes, it's the three minute, three minute gaps mm -hmm. today. Um so that, yeah, that's a good one. And again, I think that's, I could attribute a lot of gains to that one. Do you feel like it's a physiological gain or something that you, you think of that effort when you're in a race and like it, do you, you know, uh, what do you feel like is the gain? Like it's, I don't know how to put this into words exactly, but is it that you finish the session or you're in a race later and you think of, oh man, that session was helpful for me here. Like, how do you gauge I gain from that? I think, I mean, there's definitely got to be the physiological side. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I hadn't actually thought about in a race thinking like, oh, I've done this before. Mm. But I, I, I think I do. Like now that you bring it up, it's one of those ones, especially like, I feel like that's where this year I've been quite good when there's just like, it's at the end of like a hard race and there's like really hard efforts, like isolated efforts, um, which is funny because that used to be where I just fall apart. Like at the end of a hard race, that was just, just gone. But mm -hmm. this year it's been where this is the group keeps whittling, whistling, whistling. And I'm I find myself I'm still there. So yeah, yeah, I do think that's that's quite good uh, for that. And you know, I'm always thinking like, yeah, I've I've done this kind of power, this kind of short duration. So no, it's yeah. I was thinking of you because of like other I can't remember if it's a video or an article where you're like, you know, I'm a sprinter, but I do try to be well rounded. And if anyone can even identify as a sprinter, they know that race to the race to the race to the finish line. Like it's not just like, oh hey, we're all here like chilling. Oh, we're gonna go sprint now. Okay, see ya. But it's like that on the gas. <laughs> oh, oh my God. And that person goes. And so I'm thinking like, oh, eight by two, da da da. Like you get to that sixth one, you're like, oh, this is like that course where you know you got these undulations and stair step and blah, 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 blah. But um would you ever do any like 30 15s or 40 20s uh you know i haven't i think i got i got prescribed uh uh what was it maybe a third i think it was a 30 30 once this year mm -hmm. i have done in the past like previous coaches i've had a few like my first coach i had a lot of that kind of like 30 30s 45 15s 50, you know all the the variations kind of thing yeah. um but yeah this year, or maybe twice i had a couple this year uh, okay. I think it was more like just coming into the first couple of races just to get that like a bit more snappiness. Mm. Yeah. I'm always curious. It seems like it's like, kind of like a love hate type workout. Some people swear by them. Other people are like, eh, I don't really like that. Kind of seems some people who are more anaerobic like it. Cause it's just like what they're naturally, their body just loves to just go crazy and then have some rest. But what's up? Let's give your, who's your new coach now. Let's give him a shout out. 
Uh, John Baker. He's John. a yeah, absolute legend. Yeah. Oh wait, who coached uh, Serge Powell's? Maybe. Um, I, I know he does coach quite a few. Uh, he's co- yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've I've chatted with him briefly through email, so okay. maybe down the road there might be a podcast with him. We'll see. Spoiler alert. Um, trying <laughs> yeah. trying to make some things. Out. I was like, wait a minute. So, what do you think? Um, have you ever self coached before? No, I think. So, like, here's my opinion. I think now I'm at a point where I sort of have the knowledge where I could kind of do it. Like, obviously, I'm not, you know, as knowledgeable as John, but I think I could kind of do it if I needed to, mm-hmm. based on knowledge. But in terms of, like, the whole motivation, not maybe not motivation isn't the right word, but I just don't, like, there's a whole thing for me. And when people tell me they self-coach, I'm like, wow, that's that's really impressive because I don't think I could, I would always be second-guessing myself. Mm-hmm. But am I doing too much, too little? I, I just, I couldn't, I don't think I could do it. There's just no way. That is the biggest thing. I mean, even I've tried self-coaching. I've been coached. I've had many different coaches. And that's the thing is it tells me that I don't have to do more all the time. And then I also, when I need a little extra motivation, which I'm pretty intrinsically motivated, I scrape the bottom of the barrel where I don't want to say I just dig deeper, but I feel like, if I'm in an interval set and I'm coaching myself and it's just not going well, sometimes I'm like, ah, whatever. I'm just going to, now, nah, like maybe I just, this wasn't the workout for today. But when I have yeah. someone else that wrote it there that I know is looking at everything else and in the big picture is like, hey, this is probably a good workout for today. I'm like, I can do this. Like Landry believes in me. I'm I'm going to complete this. And it's even this morning, I yeah. felt the same way. It's just like, ah, oh, it's just so motivating to have when you know someone else is looking not only over your shoulder, but looking out for you. So that's my biggest, like, yeah, it's, it's definitely a different vibe when you're rolling solo. Yeah. What yeah, do exactly. you, th- what do you think? Um, And not saying a coach ever made a mistake, but do you ever feel like you made training mistakes or something in the past that maybe didn't go so well for you that we can try and learn something from? Man, I've made, I've made so many mistakes. I was just thinking the other day or today, actually, I was thinking like it's almost uh it's almost like annoying because like for example last year I thought yeah man I'm really good like I'm super disciplined like I- I'm following everything I'm doing everything like so well and this year I'm like oh I'm way better than that guy last year and it's like on the one hand it's annoying because last year I thought I was good and obviously that wasn't as good as I could be and on the other hand it's like great because you always want to keep getting better um but going back to things that I've done wrong yeah like I said loads of things I think number one actually for me was nutrition uh mm-hmm. on and off the bike so to start with right when I started cycling before I was really serious and had a coach even I was like not eating anywhere near enough on the bike like I'd have like, I'd have like one little granola bar that might have like 15 gram of carbs for like a four hour ride I'd be like oh guys I'm feel- I'm just I just keep bonking I just I guess I need to keep training more and it's just it wasn't working um but it's like I I found I keep getting levels to like oh maybe I need like twenty grams an hour oh no that thirty grams an hour oh and you know now racing at like one hundred and twenty grams an hour it's like a, an epiphany every time of like oh actually this is what you need and then the same goes for off the bike. Let me um, ask you real quick, not to cut you off. What what was that process though when you realized it was the fuel because so many cyclists still to this day do not fuel enough and I have very smart people that I had a guy who two and a half years in, he finally was like, man, I just, I feel like I know what I'm putting in my bottles and what I'm eating is just sugar. And my brain tells me that's like, I hear that sugar is bad. I'm like, but dude, you are going out and burning 4,000 KJs. You need this energy. And he lives in Europe and he was doing this huge grand fondo. And he's like, I did all the sugar. Oh my God, dude. I felt like a Superman. I'm like, why is it taking yeah. you this long to believe? Like, I'm not trying to like make you fat or lie to you. But yeah, people have a hard time conceptualizing what the fuel is. Where was where were you on that journey when you're like, okay, wait, I need to actually you started clearly counting the carbs before your ride and like doing the math in your head and not just being like, Oh, I just grabbed some stuff and out the door I went. What was that process for you? Yeah. So yeah, when you first do it, you feel like just superman like in here it's like whoa whoa um like it's three hours in i still feel i'm fresh it's like what's going on um and yeah like it really was like a progression so there was like the first like you know 15 gram of like granola bar that's not good and then it was like in a race oh yeah i'll have like a couple of these gels an hour and even then like for a race if it's 20 gram gel 40 grams an hour that's that ain't gonna do it 
Um, so it really was a progression where I was like, okay. And I got to the point where I'd be like, okay, three gels an hour. And then it got, it did get better and better until, and I gradually went sort of in and out of tracking calories. Uh, and then the point, so it was the point probably this year was like the best where I was like, okay, you know what? Let's just do this properly. Let's just not track calories here and there. Let's just do it. Um, and that's where I've like, you just get a full, the full picture. Cause it really is for me as well. It wasn't just like I could eat sometimes the right amount in a race but it would be the night before they let me down or even two or three days before they let me down. And it's like, you really want to get like, and I think that's just as important as the fuel in the race. It's like, there's no use having 120 grams of carbs an hour. If for dinner you had fish and chips, like that's a joke I have with my mate because he had fish and chips before national Ooh. champs. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It's just the full picture. Um, but I guess, I guess you could say the realization. Yeah. It was gradual, but there's just the few key moments where it's like, yo, I feel incredible what could that be yeah you know? before you go into off the bike do you still track calories yeah yeah so i i didn't i didn't off in off season which i actually struggled with because i sort of been doing it through the season most of the time mm. um and i almost i guess i lose perspective of like what a normal person eats you know what i mean like oh because i guess i'm my appetite is now based on my brain more than it is on sensations um so sometimes, like, especially because, so I tell people I'm tracking calories and most people assume, oh, be careful because you don't want to, like, cut too many calories. I guarantee you 90%, probably 95% of the days where I'm, like, changing my diet based on the tracking, it's because I'm forcing to eat more to match mm -hmm. what I've burnt. Because mm -hmm. what, like, what happens is people will do, like, three days in a row, they'll do some hard rides, they won't eat enough, and then they'll be in, like, some crazy deficit, they're cracked, and then they eat, like, three pizzas. And they feel, and then like, like, it kind of feels better, but it's just like, they probably had more calories and feel worse. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, the so that's, yeah, just making sure you eat enough, especially if like those stage races and the long training days, it's a challenge. I can, I can definitely see, I had tracked calories probably in 2017 pretty heavily. And then it just became, I did it for maybe a year and a half, just became, I just kind of stopped liking it. Um, I felt like it was really educational. And then this year I was at a gravel race and it was one of those times I feel like when I'm by myself at a race, I travel there. I'm like at the hotel. I'm like waiting to go to bed. And I was just like eating carbs. And I was thinking, I actually have no idea how many carbs I'm eating. Like this would be kind of interesting to go back into tracking. So I got back into it and I did it probably for eight months or so, maybe less than that, six months. The only thing that I don't like about it is I do sometimes feel like then I'm eating to the app and number one, the basal, basal metabolic rate is kind of a guess unless you use like a pro there's a product now that our other coach had uh, did a podcast on called Calorify where you can find out exactly how much you're burning every day. Um, so that's, that's a guess. But then also I just feel like the human body is more complicated than calories in calories out when you're an athlete burning so much. Like it made me worried. Is it, I know we have KJs, but like, like you said, sometimes I felt like I was forcing myself to eat and other times I would be super hungry and I'm like, ah, but I only have like 500 calories left. And it just didn't, Maybe I needed to move away from those thoughts and literally just track, eat what I'm going to eat and keep track of it and see where it, you know, maybe check in every week. But like for me, the eating to the app, I just felt like a weird disassociated thing from training and nutrition. And so I've kind of gone back to buy feel, but I, I know what you mean. Like it's when you're doing a stage race or you're training a ton, it can be hard to, you. I just think I'm like, how much have I eaten? Do I need, I did notice my protein was low most of the times. Oh, I, yeah. I don't naturally eat a ton of meat. Like I do like it, but there would be days where I'm like, well, 50 grams, damn, that's definitely not enough for someone my size. So yeah, I think pluses and minuses is interesting. Oh, I, yeah, I agree. I think like just a short stint. Like I remember I said before I got into it properly, like more regularly, I was like, yeah, do three weeks. This is like, you know, telling my friends do three weeks. That's enough. And it will like give you so much insight. Um, but like you said, the basal metabolic rate, that's like, I think that's the way you have to be really careful. Cause I've seen people even like being approached by nutritionists and stuff and they give them this number that's like way, way too low. 
Mm. And like, honestly, I think the best way to actually do it is just by trial and error. Like, you know, get a baseline, eat to it. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling like hungry and I've not got energy on my rides. Okay, let's bump it up a bit. Or if you're losing weight, bump it up and, you know, vice versa. Mm. I think with that kind of thing, it really is trial and error more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And like you said, yeah, sometimes you feel hungry and it's like, okay, time to eat. Because like for me, I know if I don't eat enough, the next day, the ride is not going to work. Like Come I'll away. try and do zone two, can't do it. I'll try and do it. Like it's a write off. Like some people, I think they can sort of, uh, they can sort of cope with, with they they'll be like you know just slightly worse a rider if they don't eat enough. For me, it's like if it's like a bit not enough, game over. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing. So I that's guess, annoying. I guess that's an say, annoying feeling when the day is like smashed because you didn't eat enough. It's like oh man, that yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. And I always think it's annoying because it's like, damn, I locked my fate in last night when I didn't eat enough. And I've woken up now, but there's nothing I can do. Like, mm-hmm. um, well, you know, sometimes there's, there's been some rough days where I'd be like, damn, I'll eat like loads of breakfast, wait. And then the ride starts at like 4 p.m. or something because I'm still trying to digest all this food. But <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm better now. I'm much, much better at it. And you were going to say something about nutrition off the bike before. Um, maybe it wasn't the healthiest foods or quantities or where were you going with that? Um, I guess there's a few things like um, quantities, not so. I guess quantities, yeah, but for the same thing we just said, like not mm. enough generally. Mm. Um, and then quality, man, there was a period of time, like I guess it's probably around like first year, first year under 23, when I was just like ready meals. Like that was my thing, drinking like ready meals to like dinner every other day. What's a, um, I don't know what a ready meal like a oh like meal? a microwave meal oh yeah, okay yeah, got it got it got it bang it in the microwave and then yeah. you know five minutes and like oh they're so bad that's like just the process I don't want to be like I think there's a lot there is definitely nuance but I'm like a big advocate now of like I don't say like whole foods but just reducing processed foods mm-hmm. as a general rule of thumb is mm-hmm. like if you had to make one rule without tracking anything I would just say eat as much vegetables as possible and try and reduce processed foods. And I think you'll get a long way just by doing that. Huge. Matt, I've been on like a no preservative, no preservative kick. Um, I was listening to a podcast, I guess in the U S it's like 60% of kids are now on ultra processed foods. It's 50% in the UK. So you guys are beating us by a little bit. And uh, (laughs) they're saying that just, you know, it's not getting better. Um, Yeah. The next, you know, and that's the thing when kids are taught, that's what you eat that's what they're going to teach their kids. And so in a few generations, who knows what's going to happen with the food, but yeah, I agree hundred percent. It's just try and be as natural as possible. That's one thing I love about Europe and just the food is so much cleaner and even the same food you can get is processed very differently. It's either processed or not. And so, yeah, I think that's a, a huge tip for people to try and stay away from that stuff and be vigilant with it. What is, so we kind of talked about a mistake. What about any advice that you received or maybe even like from a more action standpoint, maybe a race preparation that you've gone through in the past that really worked well for you for a race that you remember where you're like, man, I did that thing for that two weeks beforehand or so-and-so gave me this tip and that helped me in this case. Like, does anyone pop into your head that was just like a piece of gold that someone else can take from this podcast? Yeah, actually. I mean, I'm trying to think, I don't know if it, if it, oh, I think it does apply to a, a lot of race situations. So this was my previous coach. He was also my DS last year. I absolute legend. He was, you know, like Olympic, I think Olympics world champ, I mean, pursuit world champ back in, back when he raced. What's his name? Um, Colin Sturgis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was, so he was my DS. This was in the, the Tour of Britain. I got drafted up to the Tour of Britain like super last minute because the other guy broke his collarbone, sadly. Um, and it was, I can't remember which stage. I think I'd been, oh, it was, that was it. It was, uh, I, had a, I had a flat, put my foot down for the flat and then my cleat broke. So he changed the wheel. I set off. I'm like, my pedal keeps coming out. What's going on? I see my cleat broke. I didn't have a spare set of shoes. So we stopped for like, oh, I must've been like a minute. And like, what do we do? And then he was like rummaging through a bag and had someone else's spare shoe that was like one size different from mine. So it actually fit. So I was like, okay, let's go. So we're chasing for ages behind the car. And we finally caught like a couple of guys who either had a flat or whatever reason were chasing back on. And he was like, Red, you need to close that gap right. I don't know if we can swear, but right in now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay. And it was like, yeah, go full gas right now because otherwise you're not getting in. Um, and, you know, sprinted, got on. 
obviously recovered and then we got back into the bunch um and i think i've i've called on that memory so many times this year where it's like okay and it's not always getting back on it's sometimes getting into a move but it's like okay you need to go full gas right now or mm-hmm. you're not gonna get to where you need to be in the race it doesn't, like forget about any about recovering it doesn't matter you need to get there right now and i think that's like so valuable that is huge. And I think there's a lot of riders, especially newer riders, that they're, I don't know if scared is the right word. They're intimidated by that moment in the race because they think, I might blow up right now. And mm. it's like, well, if you do, you do. If you don't take this action right now, your race is over anyways. Like, this is the moment. Go for it. Yeah. And just, yeah. I think that's a, that's an amazing thing to pass on to people. And I think we also as athletes at times can underestimate what we can do in a race scenario. And it's like, you don't stop looking at the Watts, go race the race. And as things unfold, like if someone puts in a big move and you, your brain is telling you, this is it just go. Um, yeah, I think we can be over analytical and paralysis from over analysis. So yeah, that's massive. What's, do you think was tour Britain, the hardest race you've done? Uh, yeah, well, so, okay. So I didn't finish. If, if I had finished, I'm sure it would have been the hardest, but it's not like the hardest I've gone. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I was looking through, you've done a lot, of, you've done some big races and it's, I, I got to see, I was living very briefly before going to Belgium, um, in Manchester and I went to stoked on Trent and actually Matteo Trenton won that day. And the guy that oh, I yeah. stayed with, I was in an Airbnb. He didn't know anything about cycling. I'm like, yo, I'm going to tour Britain. He's like, wait, what is this thing? I'm like, he's like, how oh, do I not know about this? I live in this country. I'm like, well, it's cycling. Like, it's not like that massive. But we went to Stoked on Trent, saw the race. Um, I had watched it. I had an injury a couple years before, and that's when I kind of fell in love with the race. It just, there's, I don't know what it is. There's always a lot of action in that race. What is it? Six stages, seven stages? Like it's not too long. Eight, but it's, I think. Is it eight? Okay. Yeah. So it's like it's long enough that like there's a storyline to it. I just, Tour of Britain, it has a, uh, a spot in my heart for just being a good race to watch. And it always just seems like there's some savage bike racing on those roads. So I was like, I wonder if this is the hardest race he's done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely in terms of like how hard it would have been to get a result, like no doubt. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So when you're going through uh some workouts, maybe even like the ones that you like this five by 10, or you're doing your VO two max, do you have any pre-workout thought processes or like things you think about that help you get through the tough parts? Maybe you're already thinking before you start of like how the fourth one's going to feel. What's your mindset there? Uh, okay. I've got, I've got a good one. Actually. I've got two things that I always, almost always think about. So the first one is this is, I made this rule for myself back when I was a junior. Like when it was something like, you know, three by 20 sweet spot, which I don't really have in my program now, but that was something I had a lot back then. Good. Um, and I was like, I would always tell myself, man, if, if you can do a third of this, of this session, then you can do the rest. And if you, if you've done a third and you don't do the rest, then you're just being a bitch. That's what I would <laughs> tell myself every time. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a quick little mic drop. So yeah. <laughs> what do you do? What's your process if you're doing the five by tens and you are after the third one, you're pretty smoked. You're like below the target. Are you grinding through two more 10 minutes at whatever power you have? Or are you packing it up? And cause now you're halfway through, it's not really more than halfway through. It's not like you can maybe go do it the next day. It doesn't really make sense to do that. Like, do you want to try and finish as best you can? Are you going home? What's your, where are you going? Yeah, I, you know what? I'm not sure if I've been in that situation where it's like I'm really failing, like at number three. Oh, mate, there's been a couple of times I have. Um, there was, there was. To be fair, this year I've been fortunate. Like I've been, like I said, of the diet. When I focus on diet and do everything right, I've managed to just. I haven't really had those days. Or mm-hmm. There's been like a couple. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think yeah, if I'm if I'm doing three, like I'm just gonna just get myself through. It. Even if I'm like, okay, let's just reframe the mindset. Let's drop twenty watts. Mm-hmm. Um. Or I don't, yeah, I think that's probably what I would do, even if maybe the better thing to do would be to drop a couple minutes instead of a drop the watts. Mm, um, I like that too. But I think from like the mindset of me wanting to complete the session, I would more want to drop the watts and get that, you know, that satisfying like 10, 10, 10, 10 in the, right, in the training right. peaks. Um, although I, when you fail a session like that, it's still like, for me, it's, it's a bad day. Like I want to at least meet the target. 
Um, and I usually like I set my sights on, you know, the top sort of half of the target at least. So yeah. usually I've got a bit of wiggle room where if I'm having a bad day, okay, we're still in the range, kind of, like technically, but mm -hmm. it's still not a good, uh, a good. That should be. I, I think I still try and get through it. Um, yeah. Not like that. It's what's. Do you miss doing sweet spot at all? I'm always curious about sweet spot. I'm not a huge fan of sweet spot. I love to hear you doing like these 105 percent intervals. I think those are really underrated. Um, do you just feel like there's not enough time to do sweet spot? Like you're too busy doing other stuff, or do you not get as much benefit from that? Or where do you kind of sit with that type of riding? Uh, I don't miss it to be honest. Like I found it was like, I don't know if it's just more indicative of where I was as a rider at the time, but I just find it like a, a frustrating kind of session to not frustrating it's just like i felt like it was harder than it gives credit for or harder than it should be mm -hmm. so I, i'd much prefer to do like a fat max session or a threshold session right but yeah I, that's, that's just where i'm at now yeah we've posted some stuff about it and people are like why do you hate sweet spots so much i'm like i don't it's not that i hate it it's just a it's part of a training zone it's just i think you could spend your time a lot better for what you're trying to accomplish so anyways i'm just yeah always curious what people have to think about that What's uh kind of last training question? This is kind of more of like a life one um, that I was thinking about. Is there anything off the bike that has been a challenge that, you, that you've had to overcome that has made you a more a better athlete in some way? Um, let me think. I guess so. Obviously, we covered like the food stuff. Um, the S and C, I guess that was. So I've been doing that for a long time. Actually, my first coach sort of got me into it. Uh, there's been a couple again, of what was it? S and C, sorry, like strength and conditioning. Oh, okay. S and C. I like I've never heard somebody say that. S and C. Look at oh, sorry, that was like a, a British thing. Um I might just not be I might not be in the know. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah, no, I've been doing that for ages, like for most seasons, you know, some seasons maybe not so much. Um, and that's always been like a big part, especially like as a sprinter. Although I I say that and I would actually argue that the S and C has helped more of my all round power than just the sprint but um no this year actually so snc has always been sorry go on no i didn't mean to cut you off i'm bad at doing that but i'm curious what do you think that is about the more all-around cyclist how has that translated um oh i'm i'm not super huge on the science but i guess not even think... not, not even on the science like how in your head what is what have you done that you've done something in the gym that you're like oh this isn't helping my sprint this is helping me be better at these five by tens this is helping my view two max you're like where were you where, what's your brain thinking there i guess the the logic that i would use is so if i'm riding at like threshold for example yeah. the force that i'm putting that yes. before as a percentage of how much force i can apply is now significantly lower mm. so uh well maybe not, but it's lower so yeah i guess that that that's how it translates yeah. No, I think it's huge. I think so many athletes will just say, I just feel like I have another gear. And we're like, what yeah. is everybody now these days? And I love that there's some very smart science people who are like, okay, we're not riding bikes in a lab. Everyone's like, where's the study? What's the physiological exact ex explanation? That some We just don't know everything about cycling in our body yet, but the force, the torque, um, there's something to just driving a big gear after you do deadlift squats what are you what are you doing in the gym what's the routine are you lifting heavy are you doing four reps eight reps give me as much nitty-gritty as we can get into um not super heavy i don't go anywhere near one rep max um okay. i've seen too many people just you know screw their season up by getting a back injury in december mm -hmm. um and so i've got an snc coach mb fit shout out to him cool. uh, he's been really good uh and it's been very so uh, pretty much a, like a combination of a lot so we have you know squats deadlifts um and then a lot of core stuff. So we'll usually do like a circuit. So if we're doing like squats or deadlifts, he's like, let's use your aerobic, your aerobic like power as a cyclist. We'll just bang in like a couple of other correctives and core stuff. So I'll do like a rotation, I'll do squats, and then I'll do, I don't know, like a side plank or like a planked shoulder tap. Um so you're doing like three by then... eight squats or five by five or um I think at this time of year it's more like three by 12 so okay. more of the higher rep range lower weight and building okay. back into it especially because last year i actually so last year was the first year i was doing um glute bridges 
Mm. Um, but I think I wasn't. So when I went to Calpe and I wasn't with him, I, I don't know. I, I don't actually, I still don't know to this day what the exact issue was, but I ended up getting like a small hamstring injury, um, which I think it was to do with the fact that my range of motion there was like bigger. So I was going into a range that I wasn't used to, but with the same weight. And that just like, it was like a week off the bike, gradually get back onto it. Mm. Thought I was fine. Went back into the gym cautiously. And then same thing again, another week off the bike. Um, and it was like, it was so frustrating. So I hadn't actually like, I just like, okay, let's just not do gym. Let's just be real careful for this season. And luckily it was like still okay. And I still had an okay season. Um, but yeah, hands, I'm not going to be doing any uh, glute bridges this season. Or if I do just low weight, just as a sort of, um, you know, like rehab kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What's, um, do you do trap bar deadlift or straight like Olympic bar? Uh, straight bar. Okay. And then you do a lot of, what's your favorite core routine? Um, so I have, so normally the way the week goes, there'll be two like legs at like proper sessions. Um, and then through the week, three core and corrective sessions, which I do like 15 minutes in the morning before the ride. Um, and my favorite one, I guess my like go-to is the shoulder tap. So it's just plank position, uh, hand straight, and then just one down, one down, mm. um, like that. And then there's just a few other correct, like, um, oh yeah, Pavlov, pa or Palov or Pavlov press, like kneel Pavlov. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing like a resistance band. So I'll be kneeling, so the resistance band's going to the side, and you go from like in here, and then out is a rep because it's, it's like pulling the twist. Okay. Um, so that I really like that one. I don't know why I just like. Sounds kind of um, dynamic. Yeah. 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 Cool. What is thinking towards 2024? What's your big goal for this upcoming season or goals that you're kind of laying out with your coach? Um, I guess you could sum up the goal into getting like a world tour pro tour contract. Um, so it's like what doing whatever it is enough to to you know get connected with the right team. Um, and that that that's the thing where it comes down to like it's quite arbitrary. You know, one team might be like hey a couple wins here is enough one team might say you need 10 wins um so it is just like doing as well across the board we haven't like really looked at the calendar um because the calendar is not like solid we've got a few things um but i think it is just consistency like in the, at this point there needs to be wins like podiums yeah but beyond a podium it's not really going to make a difference i don't think mm -hmm. so we just need to focus on getting like the proper results um the wins in the like point twos um mm -hmm. and then also some good performances in the point ones I think that's like really important to showing what you can do. Do you guys have a good lead out train or do you have to like do a little bit more surfing in these bigger races or how does that, how do you think about that? Cause it's something that a lot of us, I don't think about, I'm not a sprinter. So I don't think about that aspect of the team dynamic. How do you plan to navigate? Um, have you thought about that at all? Yeah. So it's, it's really difficult. So I had like quite a lot, like a lot of top 20 from 10th to 20 position where I was, I was in the bunch. I made the selection. And then it's just like navigating that bit solo is often like, it's really difficult, mainly from a skill point of view, where it is just a learning curve. I mean, obviously there's power stuff as well. And there's, you know, really strong riders, but the skill is like, it's really difficult to just figure out. You have to change your mindset from, you know, a local circuit race that I might do over here. Um, and in terms of a lead out, so the start of the season, it was like a lot of times it would be like just one or two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we got through towards the season, you know, the, the guys, we gelled together a bit more. We had a, We'd had a few like newer signings. Um and then the race where I did win, say in Tora Bulgaria, we had like the full team, like a really, really good lead out where everyone did the job like perfect perfectly. Um and there's we've got two sprinters, or we had two sprinters last year. Uh, me and my good mate Matt, who was actually my teammate the year before. So we've like got I'd say a pretty good amount of chemistry. You know, we'll talk to each other on the road, say, you know, I'm feeling good or you're feeling good. And we're always like pretty honest now. Mm. Um so we've got, I think we've got quite a good dynamic. And then going forward to next year, I think it's it's got better. We've got a few like new signings that are pretty strong. Um, and then obviously we've got that year in the bank of chemistry and team working together. So hopefully I think next year it should be really, really good. That's awesome. That's super exciting when you're going in through the off season and you're just like chomping at the bit to go race with your boys. Oh, it's like, I'm oh, so is... gassed. I'm yeah. so gassed. <laughs> um, we, we'll be getting the team bike soon as well. Um, you guys ride? Say again. What are you guys riding? 
Oh, oh, oh no, I can't say that. I can't. Oh, oh. I nearly just spilled the beans right there. I nearly spilled. We can the we beans. can do it. We can always edit stuff out. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It's only a small fee. No, yeah. Oh, dude, <laughs> yeah, that, that's fee. what. So when do you guys we post that stuff? I just started following the team's page. They post it in like January or something. Uh, they'll probably, I think they'll post it before then. I okay. reckon they'll post it um some point in December. So yeah. What do you want to improve on the most this season to try and get you to that next level? Mm, so I was thinking about that. So I guess a bit of backstory. Last year, my sprint, like not to be too cocky, but my sprint was outrageous. Like I genuinely, like, I mean, I'm I'm generally like, I've got a bit of an ego, but last year I was like, bro, no one can be in a sprint. No, I'm, I'm untouchable. I mean, obviously, obviously there are people who are better, but I, I was really confident. Um, And it was just like the, the aerobic side that was letting me down. Mm. So this year it was like full focus on aerobic let's get to the finish of the race before we think about trying to sprint. Um, and the sprint has, like, as you kind of expect, it's gone down a little bit, not a lot, but 150 watts-ish probably mm -hmm. compared to last year. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I was literally thinking about this recently. We were like, oh, damn, it'd be really nice to get that sprint back again. But actually, I think it's still really important to keep bumping up the, the aerobic side. So I guess I'd like everything. If I had to pick one, I'd probably still pick the aerobic side. Um mm -hmm. Because sprints aren't the like sprints aren't won on like sixteen, seventeen hundred watts. Um, unless you're on a delay and you've got like an unlimited uh watt. Yeah. But um most of the time it's like it doesn't matter what you do, it's like getting to the third wheel with three hundred to go or whatever it is, depending on the race. Mm -hmm. And then the positions are kind of locked in. Like if you're in the right position, the worst that you can do is like a podium sometimes. So mm -hmm. it's it's more about that than anything else. What as a sprinter, what duration between like zero to thirty seconds do you key in on the most? Where you're like, that's the number I want to see popping off. Damn. Um. I mean, I feel like it's so easy to just focus on one second. Like that's what you tell people, right? You say, "Oh yeah, my max max power." Um. But I think if it, if it's like what's most important, yeah, I'd say like thirty, twenty, thirty second. Okay. Um. Because you usually need to do like a, a couple of like kicks at least in the last kilometer. Mm -hmm. It's like you'll kick, you'll kick to go with a move at like between a k and five hundred to go, and then if there, if not another one in between, then another final kick at two hundred or whatever it may be. Usually that... more. That's bit like sprints are never two hundred these days. They're like three hundred. Do you feel like one second even matters? I mean, I joked with one of my buddies who has a crazy sprint down here, and he was like, "Yeah, man, dude, I hit this for one second. Yeah, but what's your like eight second? You know, what's, yeah. what's one that you're actually going to win a race with? Like, one second is cool, but what if you do 1,600 and then you're very quickly at 1,200 as opposed to the guy who's just, like, 1,400 for 10? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. as a sprinter, yeah, yeah. do you even, like, do you care? I mean, maybe you care about the watts for, like, the flex number, but it's good to hear you at least say, like, eh, 20 to 30 seconds is actually more where I'm going to win something. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I don't know, not at all. I don't think it matters. Like, compared to 10 seconds, 10 second, yeah, that's worth, like, that's important. One second, A, I don't think it's important, really. Um, and B, like, there's so much, like, dodgy, there's so many dodgy one second power spikes out there. So, like, the amount totally. of, yeah. You must get this a lot as a coach, but, like, the amount of juniors who are, like, 65 kilos talking about 1,600 watts, and I'm like, bro, it's just not <laughs> true. I'm sorry, but it's not. And I was there. I was oh. there. I thought I did. I was like, second second year on a 23 but still i thought i did like 1820 watts and i was like yo this is incredible but no it was like it looked really even on like you look at the power thing it's like okay that's a reasonable yeah you just you just no like it's just yeah. i wasn't i can i wasn't doing 1800 yeah. watts not that way um so yeah it's, it's funny to like i i almost like that's why i don't really like talk about my one second much anymore because it just doesn't mean anything when you've got I think there's just so much like dodgy numbers out there, you know? Yeah. What's, uh, what's the best way for people to keep up, keep up with you this season? Obviously we mentioned the Instagram. We'll put that link in there. Uh, you've got a website. Do you blog or anything or Twitter or where do you want people to follow you at? Um, Instagram's the main one at the underscore redster. Um, I want to do more YouTube this year, but I don't want to, I'm not going to commit to anything yet, but that's also the redster. At least jumping um, on the shorts, you know, yeah. like same as your reels. Those would crush over there. Yeah. Well, you know, what? actually, I did try that. I tried that for like a month and they'd get like five likes tops. So really? The short. Yeah. The shorts algorithm. I don't know. 
Huh. I don't know. Maybe you just need more consistency or something. But yeah, I couldn't crack it. How do you get the name Red? Uh, that is just my name, straight up Red. But like um, from from, is it a family name or is it just your oh, parents? Like yo, no. so the story behind it, I, I always so I always tell people like as a joke. Yeah, my uh, great grandfather he invented the London bus. Um, <laughs> but that's yeah, that's, that's like absolute crap. <laughs> um, no, the real story is my my dad had always wanted to name his kid red like it was like yeah i'm gonna name him red boy or girl and that's a cool name um and it obviously decided that when he was much younger and yeah it stuck so it's, that's awesome yeah. it's a badass name my oh, my last question for you you had made a comment somewhere that you get the best results when you kind of like you said enjoy the process or you're like you're enjoying what you're going through maybe not focusing so much on the butterflies and like all the other things going on like hey i'm gonna go enjoy this race and whatnot how do you keep that mindset when you're trying to go to the world tour? Like you're trying to make this your career. You're trying to go like you have just in talking to you for an hour, you have big ambitions. And I absolutely love to see an athlete like yourself emanating that in not only your words, but like your posture and how you talk about it. How are you going to enjoy it? Like, do you feel any pressure? Like what, how are you going to enjoy and stay in the moment? Is it something that you think about? Or is it just like, just go have fun? Is it as easy as that? Mm, you know what? It's actually, it's, it's really difficult. I think I had a, a guy who was like, he was sort of, I guess you could call it life coaching me for a bit. Just, we'd have a call every month and he'd, you know, just talk about things. And he always said, uh, maximum performance is not at a hundred percent effort. Um, the point being there's like the flow state, you know, where they say you're sort of, you're not focusing on the pain you're focusing on. It's just pure focus, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's where I, that's where all my best results are. And getting there, that's that's really hard because it's like a fine balance of you can tell yourself in one one or another, oh, I, I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to relax. But you go too far that way and then you make mistakes because you're not focusing on things and you, you're, like, you're making stupid errors. And then obviously too focused is or too trying to focus is is stressful and then you still make mistakes. So it's I'm not sure if I could say how to do it. Um, I try to do it and sometimes or hopefully more of the time I am successful in getting into that sort of relaxed mindset. I think having people around you, actually, I think that's probably the best. If I had to pin it down, having other people who are also relaxed, but also really motivated. Um, I had a lot of, like, we had a really, really good team dynamic towards the end of the year um, in Bulgaria, especially where we're like, seriously, like, we're going to do this, let's do this, but also cracking jokes, having fun at dinners. Um, and it's just, yeah, it, it's just a knife edge, fine balance kind of thing, you know? How'd you get linked up with a life coach? Was it a recommendation for someone or was that something that you wanted on your own? No, this, this is actually the most random, random thing, actually. So he, I was reaching out to mattress sponsors because my mattress had like, um, it was done and I needed a new mattress and I, I couldn't afford to get a new mattress or like a good mattress. So I was like, okay, let's try and uh, use the platform, try and find a mattress sponsor. Um, and I found a guy who was like really interested. He's actually fairly local as well. Um, and he gave me a mattress and he's also like, yeah, let me sort of do sleep coaching as well. So that's how it started. It's like a sleep coach, you know, sleep hygiene, which by the way, like crazy gains there. Uh, and that's one thing that's probably the next thing, like food, that I'll slowly discover more and more how incredible a difference it can make. Um, but anyway, so yeah, talking to him, it started as a sleep coach and then it just sort of progressed to other things in life. Um, and it's just really interesting. He had like some really good perspective. He worked with, I think it was Chris Hoy or he'd lived near next mm. door to Chris Hoy, the track cyclist mm -hmm. at one point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he just had a, just a lot of really, really interesting things to say. Drop a sleep hygiene gem on us. What did you learn through that process? Uh, I, th I almost feel like disingenuous because sometimes it's not great still. Um, <laughs> like the consistency I think is most important. And luckily I'm, I'm someone who like, like with food, I can't function on like not enough sleep anyway. Mm -hmm. So for me, like, the low end bar is still fairly high compared to some people. Like for me, eight hours is like bare minimum. And mm. some people are like, oh yes, yeah, six hours every day. That's mm. how I'm rocking and rolling. I'm like, nah, I, I cannot function. Um, but if I had to, the one, the one bomb post ride nap, um, mm. I actually, I had one today for the first time in a while because I'm literally just getting back into training uh, sort of last week. Um, and you know, it's a good one. You wake up and you're just like, where am I? Like you just, first that stress of like, oh, I've let, I've slept in a lot. And you're like, wait, <laughs> I've already ridden today. And then like slowly the cogs start turning. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I feel refreshed. Um, 
but yeah that is honestly performance enhancing it's ridiculous are you mouth taping at all have you ever done that i've heard about it um i'm i guess i'm lucky i'm mostly a nose breather anyway okay um well i know there are still benefits just to like tape anyway but i tend to unless i'm ill block nose or whatever i tend to breathe through my mouth or through my nose sorry so maybe this is my last question. You talked kind of about the flow state. Uh, are you meditating at all? No. Um, ah, my, my dad is constantly telling me to try it. Um, and it's one of those things I've been like, yeah, I think I think there's probably something there, but I haven't got around to it. So, oh man, where's the book? Uh, people have been talking about this in this fellowship I'm in and they're like, got to meditate, dude. I'm like, okay, I don't know how to meditate really like properly. What am I going to do? And so eight minute meditation is the name of this book. And I'll post a link if I remember. And I was like, how great is this book going to be? And I didn't realize there's different, obviously different ways to meditate. But the, the second portion that we're going through right now, this little chapter where the whole point of the meditation, the first part was talking about breathing and focusing on an anchor point. Now we're talking about when sounds come out, you say you close your eyes and you hear an airplane. Don't think of that sound as don't connect it to an airplane. Just hear the sound for what the sound is. You hear this dog barking. Don't be like, oh, this dog is like messing up my meditation. Just hear the sound for what it is and like take it in and let it go. And within days, there are like annoying ass things that I would hear. And I'm like, just listen to this. What is it sound? Oh, it's not really that bad. And I was like, whoa, this is, I'm like, so I'm pumped on this book now. And I'd only yeah. done, like, I kind of was half in half out. I'm like, oh, do I need to meditate? Like, do I, do I have eight minutes a day? I'm so busy about it, like making up excuses. So check it out. Look into it. If so, the next person tells you to meditate, think about that. There's, I think there's gems in meditation that I don't even, it's like, I don't know what I don't know. Right. So yeah. I'm yeah. It's like, you need to level up. Like, so like a, a level one, like dojo, you need to get to level 10. Like, Oh yeah, dude. Know, Cat wizard, six. You know? Like, yeah, I'm out the back yeah. right now. I'm trying to get in the Peloton and move down the road. Yo man. Thank you so much for doing this. This was awesome. Really uh, be really excited to follow your results this year. A lot of people will be rooting for you. Um, I'll post, I'll let you know when we're going to post this. It probably won't post until February. We're like, we try and post or record way out. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, I could have told you about the bike sponsor. I didn't know. Oh, well, we'll let them wait on you. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I got to preface that next time. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for doing this, man. Wherever you go in life, you're going to be super successful. You've got just a great... Uh, aura or air or whatever you want to say about you so yeah looking forward to seeing what you do man yeah thanks for having me on it's been been a cool chat appreciate it awesome have a good rest of the day and uh we'll talk to you soon cool to you too man see you later see you red bye